read our passage while this music is grooving. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. Is that all right today? I'm in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, the fifth chapter. We're in a series called Rebuild, or a collection called Rebuild. And I like to describe this as season two of chapter one of our collection, because there's so many different verses. I can preach through this for 25 weeks. I'm trying to spare you. Only getting 13. And so, uh, why don't you join me? This is a... This one is important because it's talking about something that's very prevalent during our time, and that's social justice. Many of us are trying to figure out how do we respond? What's a biblical way to do it? What is justice? How do I identify it? And my hope is that I'll be able, through this example, help you see that today. Let's start with verse one. Here's what it says. It says, there was a widespread outcry. Somebody say outcry. From people and their wives against the Jewish common, the Jewish countrymen. And some were saying, we and our sons and our daughters are numerous. Let us get grain so that we can eat and live. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to gain grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have borrowed money to pay the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards. And we and our children are just like the countrymen and their children. Yet we are subjecting our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless. Because our field and our vineyards belong to others, the very things that would get us out of debt, we don't have access to them. Nehemiah says, I, when I, I became extremely angry when I heard their outcry and their complaints. And after seriously considering the matter, very, verse 7, I accused the noble, saying to them, each of you is charging his countrymen interest. So I called a large assembly against them and said, we have done our best to buy back our Jewish countrymen who were sold to foreigners, but now you sell your own countrymen and we have to buy them back. But they remained silent, could not say a word. Then I said, what, are you, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of the Lord and not invite the reproach of foreign enemies? Even I, as well as my brothers and my servants have been lending them money and grain. Please let us stop charging interest. Return their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses to them immediately, along with a percentage of the money, grain, new wine, and fresh oil that you have been assessing them. And the oppressors respond, we will return these things and require nothing more for them. We will do as you say. So I summons the priests and everyone to take an oath this day. And I shook the folds of my robe and said to them, may God likewise shake from his house and property everyone who does not keep this promise. May he be shaken and have nothing. And the whole assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they promised. Verse 14. Furthermore, from that day, Artaxerxes appointed me as governor of the land of Judah. From the 20th year until the 26th year, 12 years, I and all my associates never ate from the food allotted to the governors. The governors who preceded me had heavenly burdened the people, taking for them food and wine as well as pounds of silver. Their subordinates also oppressed the people, but because I fear God, instead I devoted myself to the construction of the wall and my, and my subordinates were gathered for their work. We didn't buy any land. And there was 150 Jews and officials as well as guests surrounding the nations at my table each day. They, this, listen to what they could have gotten. Each day, an ox, six choice sheep, some fowl were prepared for them. An abundance of all kinds of wine was provided every 10 days. But we didn't demand the food allotted to the governor because the burden was so burdensome on the people. Remember me favorably, my God, for all that I've done for this people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we don't take this opportunity lightly to share the good news of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will bless this congregation today. Lord, that this word will fall on fertile soil. Lord, you are the solid rock of our faith. We just stood and we declared that anything is possible if we have faith, Lord, because you did. But if you are not the object of our faith, if our hustle is the object of our faith, then Lord, we'll fail. But I pray right now, Jesus, 
that you will bless this word to fall on fertile soil. That you're the solid rock of our faith. Lord, we love you and we cherish you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, why don't you say amen? Amen. Thank you guys so much, man. So today, as I said earlier, we're starting season two, chapter one of our sermon collection, Rebuild. And to just give you a little bit of context of where we are in the book, Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament were actually two parts of the same book. In our modern Bibles, they were broken up, but this is a story of a man named Nehemiah. He was bought into Babylonian captivity, or Persian captivity during this time, and he had worked his way up to being the cupbearer for the king. Now, the cupbearer is not someone that just gives charcuterie boards and sips the wine. It's not a, a, an administrative assistant, if you will, but rather it is a person that is a highly influential political figure. He would have made a lot of money. He would have been a person of nobility. But as he is serving the king one day, his brother Hanani comes into the, the royal palace. And because he's interested in knowing more about the plight and predicament of his people in Israel, he says, how were our Jewish brothers and sisters going, doing? Hanani says to him, they're in despair. They're not doing well. And that just shows that one of the most important things you can do is you need to have a brother and sister in your life that is willing to tell you the truth, to not sugarcoat it, not to say that there need to be unkind, but they need to be willing to tell you the truth, even if it's going to break your heart. And so Hanani walks in, and because of that, Nehemiah just starts to cry and weep for months on end. He was able to hide his emotions for a while, but eventually he comes into the room of Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes knows him so well, he says, why are you so upset? Isn't this just sadness in your heart? Now what Nehemiah is doing is dangerous, because anytime you step into the king's presence and you're unhappy, he could think that it's treasonous. But he says, why should I be happy when my countrymen are away and they're in deep destruction. And so then Artaxerxes says something that changed the trajectory of the Jewish people. He says, what are you requesting? And because Nehemiah had been praying already, and because he had been fasting for months on end, he was prepared to answer the king. Here's what I want to let you know. When God gives you the golden opportunity, are you going to be prepared with a response for that golden opportunity? Oh, y'all not talking back to me. When God opens up a door for you to get that thing that you have been praying for, been desirous of, are you going to be prepared or are you going to be stuck? Nehemiah says, no, no, I, I, need, I need wood from the royal reservoir. I need money. I, I need resources. I need letters because as I pass through these transcontinental places, they're going to question me. I need all of these things. He was prepared because he took a season of discernment to figure out what he really needed. The reason that some of us can't capitalize on the golden moments in life is because we're, le we're led too much by our hearts and our passions and not enough by our minds to help us think, reason, and create a plan. We need head you also need heart. So, so he asks him, how long are you going to be gone? He gives him a time, and then he heads off. And he's willing to take the trek. I think it's about 900 miles. And then he comes, and he decides that he's going to rest for three days. Many of us would have gotten to work immediately. But the reason he didn't do so immediately is because he knew that he needed to give, his time, give time for his soul to catch up to his body. Some of you are moving at a pace right now that your body simply cannot keep up with. You're grinding, but you're not reorienting your life around Jesus, so you find yourself distracted, disheartened, and worried on a regular basis. Some of you, on the other hand, are doing too much resting and not enough working. Let me not even, let me not do this. You're doing too much resting. At some point, we have to stop making an idol of rest and realize that a properly planned Sabbath is better than an unplanned weekend. That if I would just slow down for a little bit, 
to commune with Jesus through some contemplative prayer, through some internal examination, through some intentional Bible reading where I'm not just speeding through the text, God can do mo more in those moments to refresh us than we can do on our own. So he rests for three days, and then he decides that he's going to inspect the broken walls because it's enough. It's okay to hear about the bad news for yourself. But sometimes you have to do the due diligence and inspect it yourself. One of the easiest ways to be let down in life is trusting the word of others without doing the due diligence on your own. So he does his due diligence. He gets to work. And as you know, when he gets to work, he's recognizing that there's a problem. The reason that there's a problem is because the walls aren't built, and it's not just about security. It means that because the walls aren't built, there's no worship to Yahweh, the deity, the one that we, the, the father, this, this triune being. He, he knows that there's no worship. The people are in dire straits. The morale is low. But he's like, yo, we're going to get the building. So in chapter one through chapter four, he starts building. But how many of you know that when you try to do anything meaningful for God, you are going to experience hostility? Hostility is not a sign that you need to stop. It's affirmation that you need to keep going. Some of y'all run into a wall, you're like, oh, it's not the Lord's will. No, it's the Lord's will that you, if you can't push that wall down, you crawl through it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because oftentimes what we lack is grit and tenacity. And he says in Jeremiah, if these runners wore you out, how are the, what are you going to do when you race up against the horses? In other words, sometimes God allows you to experience hostility because he's trying to train you, he's trying to develop you, he's trying to cultivate you. It's not because you did anything wrong. It's not because God is against you. He's not against you. He's already poured out all of the sin from the past, the present, and future on Jesus. He looks at you with delight, but he will allow brokenness into your life because he needs to cultivate your inner man and woman. And he says, if you suffer with me, you're going to reign with me. Why do I need suffering? It's because God does things in pain that can't happen in prestige. He does things in brokenness that he doesn't do when you are at the height of your life. That's the problem with the prosperity gospel. Because it does not equip you to deal with suffering in life after you've named it and you've claimed it. And that don't work. After you sowed there and expected a harvest here and that doesn't work, then you divorce yourself from Jesus when that was not how he intended this thing to be anyway. You need a framework for suffering and hardship in your life. But you will not get a framework for suffering if you keep listening to those sermon lights, those preachers that affirm, promise that you're going to get something that God never promised you were going to have. Pastor, I want to walk in my purpose. That's not that important. You don't really discover your purpose like that until you go through a little bit of hardship. Until you do a multiplicity of things, then you find out, oh, this is my purpose. And God is like, I've told you the whole time. In the words of my friend Brian Butler, the problem is many of us want a due season without a due season. We want things to happen for us, and we want to experience things that we're not really willing to work for. But everything meaningful in life is going to come with some external threats. We see that in this passage. Sam Ballot, Tumbaya are threatening them, intimidating them. And if he can't do that, he tries to distract them. What the devil will do sometimes is he knows he can't get you to turn off course because of fear. He'll just give you something else that's not quite as good as what you should be doing, but it's good enough to satisfy you. That's why distraction is dangerous. That's why some of y'all need to get focused because you're too double-minded. Let, let me not, 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 let me not. I want to be nice to you. I want to be nice. This is my first week back. I'm trying to be nice. But not only is there an external problem, but now we see in this passage that there's an internal problem. Because anytime you try to do something meaningful, you're going to have external issues and you're going to have some internal issues. 
His external issues are saying ballot to buy in the local leaders. His internal issues is, the, is a great social injustice that's happening among the Jewish people. What we see in verse 1 is that there was a great outcry from the men and the women. Anytime you see this word great outcry or widespread outcry, if the, the, the writer, who is Nehemiah, is trying to hearken us back to Exodus, when it said that the children of Israel were in Egyptian captivity and they were crying out to God for liberation. Well, they were under physical exploitation. These people were experiencing physical exploitation as well. And there was three groups of people complaining. When Nehemiah started building this wall, he had some high standards and requirements. And so he had to employ an unpaid workforce and an, an emergency army. So that took them away from the field. So many of them were living paycheck to paycheck. And if they weren't working in the field, then they couldn't harvest the crops. If they couldn't harvest the crops, they couldn't take them and sell them. If they couldn't sell the crops, they couldn't make any money. If they couldn't make any money, then they could not go and take care of their kids. But there were some who were being heavily taxed by Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes loved living like a king in a palace, so he would just give you more and more taxes. And they were struggling with that. And some were mortgaging their fields and, and their vineyards and their home, and they found themselves in perpetual debt. And what was really sad was that they were selling their children to the other wealthy Jewish owners. And the Jews were not supposed to be charging each other tax because of the Levitical law. They said you can't charge each other tax, but you can do it for someone who is not your kinsman. And so what's happening is they're running into a situation that many of us run in here, into here, they're in, they're in a cycle of perpetual debt. Here's what I have. Here's the question. I did a little bit of research on this, and I, this is the question I have. Exploitation that's happening in this passage is 100% wrong, but there are some things that you, that you and I can do at times that make us vulnerable to exploitation. Not saying it's right, but I'm saying we can make ourselves vulnerable to it. 13 years earlier, when they came back to Israel from Persia, King Cyrus gave them 4,500 elements or articles of gold and silver. They were well provisioned for the trip. Nehemiah comes back with money and resources, right? So the children of Israel had money. My question is, is how did they go broke? They had money. They weren't initially living paycheck to paycheck. How did they go broke? I'll tell you, because of unwise spending. Haggai tells us that these same people, who's a contemporary of Nehemiah, tells us that they were spending money on their paneled homes. A paneled home is when you have all of the beautiful interior design that you want. You're like, huh, I don't need Ikea furniture. I'm going to Ray Moore and Flanagan. You know, a matter of fact, I'm going to get an artesian piece of furniture on Etsy, custom made for me and my body because, you know, I got to take care of me. They had all that. But let me just tell you something, friends. Let me tell you something. You can never out earn poor spending. I'm not trying to beat you up because I preached a whole sermon collection on this. It's called Simple Money Rich Life. Go, go and look at it, it'll help you. But you can never out earn poor spending. Some of us have enough money, we're not underemployed, but we're consistently overspending for God foreseen reasons. And like the children of Israel in this passage, we find ourselves in a perpetual cycle of debt. Not popular, but true. Right? No? Here's the problem. I want to encourage you in this season, stop increasing your standard of living. Stop increasing it every time. Every time you get a raise, you're like, oh, I'm stop. it's time for me to ball out. Ooh, I'm about to... Huh. I need, I've been needing, been needing a new car. I need a new car. Matter of fact, I need a wardrobe. This makeup kit is old. I need more mascara and concealer. I need more Jordans. I haven't bought any new ones. What we need to be doing is paying off some debt. Because the borrower is a slave to the lender. What we need to be doing is living with a budget, identifying our income, our debt, and figuring out how we can save and so that we can get out. So when a famine comes or a taxation, we don't deal with the king's taxation, we deal with something called inflation. 
So when these things come, we are able to deal with it. Does that make sense today, church? But I didn't come to talk about money, even though I need to help you. Just get a budget. All right, first week back. Let me just chill out. All right, so let me teach you how to respond to injustices, okay? You ready? First one is you have to have a biblical definition of justice. A biblical definition of justice. When we hear words like justice, equity, and equality, I would describe them as loaded terms, would you not? They come full of historical baggage and have a multiplicity of connotations. But what I like to do for a second is I want to peel them back from the cultural and social context so that we can see what the Bible says about justice. Justice can be defined as this, fair and impartial treatment of all individuals and groups, ensuring that each receives what is due to them according to legal, moral, and ethical standards. That makes sense. In other words, you can lead a slide up. They want to take pictures. What we're trying to do with justice is we're trying to take care of vulnerable people and act with integrity because that reflects the character of God. Now, this concept of justice is typically, or the concept of justice really is two Hebrew ideas that come together. I'm explaining it right now. Here, here are the words. Say them with me. Mishpat, Sadakah. Mishpat, Sadakah. Mishpat, y'all Hebrew scholars. Mishpat refers to the justice system. It's like fair treatment. It's accountability. It's accountability and fairness. Someone commits the crime, and they ought to be punished for the things that they've done. And that needs to be done impartially without regard to their ethnicity, class, historicity, and all. Now, I know these things are complicated now, a little bit more complicated because of sin, but I know there's some, some laws and things we can talk about, but I know this is complicated, but for the most part, this is, how, this is what it means. It means a, a fair justice system that ensures fair treatment. Sadaqah is the other side of it. It's living righteously in your relationships. So if you have sadaqah, you don't need mishpat. If you live generously and you honor people and there's fair laws and systemic change that doesn't disproportionately affect vulnerable people, if you live that way, then mishpat becomes a backup. Does that make sense? Like if you live in a way that's loving to others, then you don't need sadaqah, but you need both of them combined. Let me show you how they're combined in scripture. Can I do that? Amos 5, 24. It says, but let justice, mishpat, roll like water, and righteousness, sadaqah, like an ever-flowing stream. Yeah. 33, verse 5. Love, he loves. Somebody say he loves. He loves. Righteousness, sadaqah, living in fair and just ways. And justice, a fair and equitable justice system that punishes people without regard to their ethnicity or class. The earth is full of his steadfast love. That's hesed. That is a combination of, that is like a love that can't be stopped or, 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 or thwarted in any way. Steadfast love of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 89, verse 14. Righteousness, sadaqah, and justice, mishpat, are the foundation of his throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Here's what I want you to see. God's throne could be based on a lot of things. Could be based on mercy could be based on love, but the text says that where God sits in eternity, its foundation is Sadaqah, living in a generous life, and, and, just, and Mishpat, which is living in such a way that you punish wrongdoing. Does that make sense, friends? Y'all with me? No? Okay. You know what that means about God's justice? It's retributive and restorative. It's retrib now, why does that matter? Because some of us are so influenced by the current justice system, where we think, we think, we say, oh, we want justice. What we really want is vindication. What we really, what some of us really want is for someone else to experience the pain that we experienced when that crime was committed. But you just don't have, you just, God just doesn't want us to have retributive justice but restorative justice to make sure that defrauded, defrauded parties are made whole. And let me tell you why I believe that. Because in give some Bible. When the children of Israel were in 400 years of Egyptian captivity, 
They were being enslaved, and God said, okay, I'm going to allow one more plague to go. I want you to go and kill a lamb, put his door, blood above the doorpost, and when the death angel comes or, the, or the, uh, when, the, when the angel comes and passes over, I won't take your firstborn, but for anybody who doesn't have it, I'm going to take their firstborn. And so there was a great outcry in the land of Egypt because the Egyptian firstborns died, but the Israelites were saved. And it was an unfortunate event, but it was caused by Pharaoh's idolatry. He believed he was God, so therefore he was unwilling to submit to God. And when you're unwilling to submit to God, you are propping yourself up as a false god. But before they left to go worship God, he said, I want you to go back into the Egyptian's house, and I want you to take the gold, I want you to put it around their neck, the pearls, the Gucci, the Louis, all of that, take it and wear it. And eventually, we know the story, they would perish, but the gold, they would, here's what I'm saying. God was, was, uh, was, was dealing with them from a retributive standpoint and punishing them for the slavery, but he was also making sure they were financially whole by making sure they had the gold, which was recompense of the time that they spent in Egypt. Does that make sense? No? Does that make sense? Shake your head, nod your head, so I can say it again. Okay. All right, just checking. Just checking. So why does this matter? Because we need systemic change, but we also need, we need people to be held accountable. So, all right, let me, gosh, I just preached so long. All right. I got eight minutes. Let me get through this. So Nehemiah, they come to Nehemiah, they're complaining, and Nehemiah could have just swept their concerns under the rug, but that's not what he did. Here's the second thing we learn. Here's the second thing. We have to respond to injustice with righteous anger. I went to go see Inside Out 2. It was a great movie. Did y'all, by show of hands, how many of you seen it? It was a great movie. When Joy came over and said, anxiety, you need to let him go? Yeah! <laughs> Boy, I almost shouted in there. I don't even know how to do it. I try to practice shouting in the house. I don't have it yet. I'm working on it. I ain't grow up like that. It's good to do. I just don't know how to do it. And so, and so the emotions are personified as people that Riley, that Riley is experiencing. She's moving to a new city. She's a hockey player. So she has all these emotions going in her, like sarcasm. I love sarcasm. Uh, joy, sadness, just ruining everything. No, I'm just playing. But I was kind of offended. That anger was this little short, stubby, fiery character. I'm like, why are you disrespecting the short kings in the house? Disney, Pixar. And the truth is that the other emotions were kind of keeping anger at bay because they knew that when anger got mad, he would blow up everything. He would, he would just tear the place down. Here's the truth. Some of, us are like, some of us are like these other characters. We try to keep the anger at bay because we know that when we, get, when we hear about anger, we get uncomfortable. It's intense. It's overwhelming. It causes our heart rate to go up. It causes our blood to rush, right? And the, part, and the reason that is is because, model, because anger has never been modeled well in our households. When our fathers got angry, they would beat our mom. Or when mom got angry, she would give silent treatment to everyone. So she wouldn't physically abuse you, but she would emotionally scold you. So the silence was deafening. But let me just tell you something, friends. Anger is a necessary motivator to change any systemic problem or any injustice that has occurred. But we have to be able to distinguish between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Righteous anger is motivated by the desire to uphold justice. It's an others-facing type of anger that says it's not right that people are being heavily taxed like this. Therefore, we need to pass some legislation in order to get this dealt with. It's not right that some folks are unable to uh, take part in the American dream because they're underpaid and because housing prices have increased so much. It's, 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 un, it's, it's righteous anger, but unrighteous anger is not sin-focused, it's selfish orientation. Whereas righteous anger has a concern for others, is managed, is controlled, unrighteous anger leads to conflict, harm, and creates division. Righteous anger says, how can I serve others 
Unrighteous anger says, how can I serve myself? So pastor, you're like, well, how do I distinguish between righteous and unrighteous anger? Here's, here it is. You have to ask yourself some questions. Slow down the pace of your life so that you can commune with Jesus through prayer, through intentional Bible reading and internal examination. Figure out what's going on in your heart. Here's a question you can ask yourself to determine whether you have righteous anger or unrighteous anger. What specifically is causing me to be angry? Like my mother would say, what are you mad at? <laughs> Who are you mad at? Right? Second one, is my anger due to a personal slight and inconvenience or am I genuinely, is there genuinely an injustice or moral wrong? Um, will my actions help or harm others? Here's the thing. God can use anger directed at sin, but he will not use anger directed at other people for selfish measures. But let me just tell you something, friends. Let me tell you this. Righteous anger is the fuel of biblical justice because God needs some people to have a righteous anger about some of the atrocities that are going on. It, it, who's going to get angry about the disparity in the healthcare system? where there's typically a lack of medical facilities able to help vulnerable people deal with preventable diseases. Who's going to be angry at the fact that African-American women are dying in childbirth at a rate astronomically high than other ethnicities? Who's going to be upset about educational outcomes, particularly for black and brown children? Who, who's going to get angry about that? Who's going to get angry about environmental hazards? that many black and brown children in particular, and I can think about Camden specifically because we lived there for almost 15 years, have to deal with pollution and smog and all type of things. Who's going to get angry about that? About corporations that get tax breaks but won't hire any of the local people and claim they're incompetent but won't want, won't, don't want to offer training but yet get 30-year tax abatements. Who's going to get angry about it? And oftentimes, we don't get angry because we're too comfortable. We're too comfortable. As long as I got me in mind and I'm taken care of, I don't care about what other people are facing. Let's just be honest. We are deeply selfish. Deeply selfish. But thank God that we have a Lord like Jesus that wasn't worried about his heavenly prestige that wasn't worried about heavenly concern. Rather, he put himself in a vulnerable position for you and I, not so that we can become rich financially, but rich in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Jesus was willing to sacrifice. Here's the, here's the next one. Got to respond that way. Here's the third one. Carefully investigate the matter. You know what I run into a lot? Virtue signalers social media activists who change their profile picture because they want to bring awareness. You ain't did nothing. We all aware. Well, you got the phone. Voice in their opinion. Your opinion is fine. But when you're going to do some action, right? And some of us get so caught up into the digital storm of online that we don't take time to carefully think through the matter for ourselves and understand both sides of the issue. Now, there are, I'm not saying that there aren't injustices, but I'm saying sometimes you need to let your emotions calm down a little bit so you can actually know the issue and talk to people about it and be conversant about it. Verse 6, he got mad. Verse 7, he considered the matter. Verse 6, he was hot. Verse 7, he cooled down. Verse 6, he was angry. Verse 7, he was metered. What I'm saying is, some of us need to slow down and control our emotion so that we can actually do something and apply principles with a sense of knowledge. And can I just talk to my leaders in the building? If you can't corral your emotion, you're not going to get the people that follow you to corral theirs. If you always upset and can't take criticism and nobody can talk to you about anything without upsetting you. You're always in your feelings. You always jump into conclusions about something. You can't expect any of the people that follow you to do the same thing. 
because the people that follow you will model what you do. Amen, Pastor. Carefully investigate the matter. Here's the fourth one. I'm almost done, so y'all can come up. Give me one second. Publicly confront the perpetrator. Woo, I like this. Publicly confront the perpetrator. Now, there are some matters that need to be handled in private. Would you agree? Matthew 18, 15 through 17 tells us, if a brother offends you, go to your brother. If he doesn't hear you, take another one with you. If he doesn't, tell it to the church, right? Because sometimes God wants private healing instead of public exposure. That's important. But if you go to 1 Timothy 20, you'll see that elders who are not ruling well should be exposed publicly. And so I, 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 I'm very, very sensitive to a lot of the fallen pastors that, are, that is happening now. I, re- I am. But you know what? I align more with the victims of their abuse than the pastors in position. So when they get dragged publicly, sometimes I'm sad because I'm in that position. But sometimes I'm saying it's a fulfillment of what the Bible says because what you do in private, God will expose you in public. I mean that. I mean that. That's just what happens. Sin will find you out. It will chase you down. Don't think that it won't. And so Nehemiah confronts him publicly. He's saying, what y'all doing ain't right. We've been trying not to sell off people, and now because of your greed, you're doing the very thing that's antithetical to what we were doing in the first place. I want you to return the fields, return the mortgage, and give a portion of the money back. Some of y'all are saying, well, Pastor, I, I, I can't call a public assembly, and I don't have the nation's ear, but you do have your family's phone number. And you know that grandpa was nasty and that he was doing some salacious things to people in your family, but yet you've been sweeping it under the rug. In essence, can be con- consenting to that very thing. You've been benefiting from your supervisor mistreating one of your co-workers and favoring you, but you won't say anything. Why? Because you're benefiting from the injustice. You got to confront some things. You've just putting it in the back. Some of us have so many family skeletons in our closet that we should start a morgue. When's somebody going to say something? When's somebody going to be honest and have the integrity and say, what you're doing is not right. Confront them publicly. Here's the fifth. Is it the fourth one? Fifth one? Come on, five, six. Come on. Jesus. Confront them publicly and be willing to recognize how you contributed to it. Verse 6, verse 10, very interesting. Nehemiah basically says, hey, I've been lending. I've been lending these goods as well. I've been lending to my countrymen. I've been giving them stuff. What, what, what I'm saying is he was, he was lending as well. I don't think he was charging interest. But because of that, he was contributing to the injustice. And so I know that you want to point a finger at people. You'd be like, well, pastor, I don't want to be a part of organizations that uh, take advantage of their employees, but you shop at places for convenience, and you know they do that. You know they do that. You know they take advantage of people. You know that the stuff is not sourced ethically. You, we got cell phones in our pockets made from batteries, made from cobalt. Do you know what they have to do to mine cobalt? and how some people don't have the proper PPE in order to get it, but yet we say that we care about justice. Some of us got porn issues in here right now, and don't you know that it's the product of women being abused and taken advantage of? Don't tell me you love justice and you watching porn because you're participating. Your consumption is creating the need for this thing to exist. It's creating it, man. Sir, and what I'm saying is, as you pursue justice, I want to encourage you to have humility. How our actions, our deeds have contributed to the injustices that go on in this world. We want cheap clothing, not knowing that there's someone in a sweatshop in a third world country working for cents on the dollar so you can look fresh and fly. Have some humility. And then lead by example. Nehemiah said, I could have 
I could have had all the wine and the food. I could have had an ox. I could have had six sheep that day, but I didn't do that. So I left my comfortable position and I aligned with the people that were working. Why? Because good leaders know you can only get people to do the things that you're willing to model. So be the example. You care about the poor? Great. What's their names? Tell me their names. It's a young lady in here that went and so, so far to adopt a child whose mother was strung out on drugs and then found out the mother had another baby and was willing to make sure that her and the other sibling got connected. That's not just compassion, that's justice, that's rectifying something that's wrong. And so you might be saying, Pastor, what do I do next? I'm saying, number one, what upsets you? What is something that causes holy and righteous indignation? Whatever it is, get involved with that. Is it educational outcomes? Get involved in that. Is it environmentally hazardous stuff? Get involved. Is it, is it, envir is it, a, is it a global warming? Get involved. Let me tell you why that's an issue. Because global warming disproportionately affects people on the equator. And it means that they're unable to generate products at the same rate because the sun is so hot and because it's scorching. It's impacting people. And let me just encourage you to have humility because all of us in here have contributed to the greatest injustice of all time. And that was 2,000 years ago. There was a chasm between God the Father and us. Adam sinned in the garden. And sin was passed on through the human nature through something called imputed sin and then I mean through inherited sin and then I had to pay the guilt of the sin through something called impunity sin so that's why Paul says in Romans 7 oh wretched man that I am because I can't do a good enough good deeds to get myself out of the hole I can't attend church enough I can't give enough there's nothing I can do to span this chasm between me and God and so my sin has contributed to the greatest offense of all time. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I don't want heaven without him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus saw the pain, Jesus saw the plight, and he said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna become a man, and I'm gonna be born of the Holy Spirit and also of Mary. So I'm gonna be man enough to owe the debt, but I'm gonna be God enough to pay the debt. And so the Holy Ghost overshadows the womb of a virgin Mary. She gets pregnant, gives forth Jesus. Jesus could have been born in a palace. He could have been born as a king, but he was born as a poor servant in the back room of Jerusalem. Born in the dirt. He was probably born in the dirt. And it's probably symbolic of how he's trying to restore things that came from the dirt. And so he, born in the dirt, he grows up and eventually He's sent to the cross of Calvary and he's on trumped up charges by the Jewish Sanhedrin and the religious leaders they say this man is a blasphemer he's causing riots and all that he died as an injustice but we see in Acts 2 that he not just dies from from that alone we see that he dies because the sins of the past the present and the future are on Jesus you and I would have to pay for our sins and eternity, but Jesus decides that I'm going to pay for them on the cross. And he goes up to the hill. He goes up to Calvary's hill, and he's got a crown of thorns because part of the curse was that the ground was going to produce thorns and thistles. He, he was pierced in his side because Eve came from his side. And he in every way identifies with us. And the sun and the, the sun went black. And the sins of the past poured out on Jesus. Our injustices poured out on Jesus. All of these things poured out on Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take him down. They wrap his body with ointment and they put him in the tomb. And it's a Sabbath day, so they weren't gonna see him all day Saturday. So they just in perpetual doubt and anxiety. And, frustration and discontentment and, and worrying about what's going on and so early in the morning some ladies went to the tomb and they like yo who's gonna roll this stone away and they get to the tomb and they find out the stone's been rolled away and they're like oh my god somebody stole his body 
but they realize that nobody's stolen his body. He's raised from the grave. The same spirit that was hovering over the waters, the same spirit that was there with Jesus during his baptism is the same spirit that reversed rigor mortis. It's the same spirit that reversed the atrophy in his body and caused Jesus to stand up and get up from the grave with all power in his hand. And when he got up from the grave, he destroyed sin, he destroyed death, he destroyed all of these things that hold us back and he ultimately reverses the greatest injustice that has ever existed and that's death itself. So here's what I want to say to you friends. Come to Jesus. You want to reverse a lot of the injustice in the world? Come to Jesus because you can have Jesus and justice. Because Jesus said you tithe on cumin and mint and dill, but you forget the weightier matters of justice. So Jesus cares about and is willing to reverse it. But the greatest issue he took care of is your sin. The thing that's keeping you away from God. And he wants to bring you back to him today.